you would just see it play out. Like a story about someone in the family would pop up for a minute, and they go, we gotta make that go away. That upsets people, it shifts the balance. How does the documentary portray Harry and Meghan as opposed to William and Catherine and other members of the royal family? And what does this portrayal reveal about Harry and Meghan's goal with the documentary? This video will analyze words, camera angles and sound. Make sure you watch until the end, because the plot is about to thicken. I analyze interviews and conversations from a linguistic standpoint. In this video, I'll also draw on my educational background in media studies, including film theory. Click the like button and subscribe if you're new. Let's get the party started. First off, it's useful to understand what we're about to see through the lens of the actential model. Practically all movies and documentaries use this model in order to structure the narrative. For the purposes of this video, the four most important roles are the subject who has something they want to achieve, an object. The opponent is the one stopping the subject from getting the object. The subject has helpers that help them get the object. Harry and Meghan are the subjects. Their main goal, object, is to shift blame. Thus, the media and even Harry's family are portrayed as opponents. Harry and Meghan have helpers in form of lawyers and friends who are the only ones allowed to voice their opinions. There was a real kind of war against Meghan. We start out with a hyperbole. It's prefaced by the hedge, kind of, expressing a certain level of uncertainty. Very likely because the lawyer knows that she's not talking about a real war. She's using this dramatic word for dramatic effect or pathos. The ominous music paraphrases her dramatic claim. Megan. The word real, which modifies the noun war, is interesting, as it has a persuasive function. This way, linguistically, the presupposition behind her claim is that many people are skeptical of this claim. And indeed, the entire point of this documentary is to persuade people who doubt Meghan and Harry's multi-million dollar victimhood. The camera zooms in, letting us get closer to Meghan in a literal sense and inviting us to see the world through her eyes in a symbolic sense, inviting us to see behind the veil, so to speak. And I've certainly seen evidence that there was negative briefing from the palace against Harry and Meghan to suit other people's agendas. The ominous music continues and it's carried over from scene to scene. This way, all scenes get the same mood, which, in terms of filmmaking, creates coherence in longer sequences. We see the palace in a long shot frame. Framing or distance is one of the stylistic devices filmmakers use to bring us close to certain characters, the intended protagonist, while distancing us from other characters, the intended antagonist. In this frame, we're far away from the palace, which is consistently portrayed negatively. It's in direct contrast to the preceding close-up of Megan, the intended protagonist. We also get a close-up of the lawyer, a helper, as she's speaking to an interviewer who's outside the frame. Because the interviewer doesn't challenge her claims or interjects, her claims have absolute truth value, in theory, that is. She mentions the word agenda. What often happens when filmmakers seek to persuade people is that they monopolize certain words before the opposing side has a chance to. Harry did it in this clip. To see this institutional gaslighting. He uses this word because he and Meghan have been accused of doing this. Monopolizing words is a common way of anticipating objections, claiming that the other side is intolerant or whatever, because the people claiming it are the ones who are actually intolerant whatever this overused word even means anymore. This way, it's interesting that she uses the word agenda, as the audience should indeed be questioning her agenda, because there's no source questioning her claims. She says other people, which is a vague way of addressing the opponent. Generalizing a faceless, nameless group like this is an easy way out compared to assessing the reliability of each specific instance. This observation is congruent with the fact that she says that she's seen evidence without explaining what this evidence is. She um, uses the adverb certainly, again underlining the prominent persuasion element in her rhetoric. Ironically though, an adverb like certainly should actually make us question the certainty of what she's seen. 
Meg became this scapegoat for the palace. And so they would feed stories on her, whether they were true or not, to avoid other less favorable stories being printed. Lots of interesting things to unpack here. First of all, we have voiceover over images of the palace from the outside, symbolically underlining how Meghan and Harry felt like outsiders or were shut out, according to them. The palace is portrayed as a distant and closed off entity. This is in contrast to the friend's word choice. She uses the nickname Meg, which expresses closeness and warmth, underlining Meghan's role as protagonist in contrast to these closed off images representing the opponent. This friend's another helper, according to the actantial model. The distance we're supposed to take to this opponent is also highlighted by the friend's use of metonymy. Meg became this scapegoat for the palace. Metonymy is a figure of speech by which a word that's associated with something is used to refer to that thing. In itself, a palace can't do anything. It's the people inside the palace that are able to do things. Metonymy is used for effect rather than literal meaning, and it makes a single sentence more powerful or manipulative, if you will. Here, it heavily emphasizes the supposed resistance against the power couple. The friend also invokes the classic scapegoat narrative as a way of emphasizing Harry and Meghan's roles as protagonists. This narrative has obvious biblical connotations, but no comparison seems to be too big for this organic duo. Notice how the friend takes low-key jabs at the palace, thus emphasizing its status as opponent. She says that they, a vague pronoun, would feed stories on Meghan to avoid other less favorable stories being printed. The implication then is that there was a considerable amount of negative stories about the other members of the royal family. Harry implied something similar when he made a rhetorical attack on his brother. They were happy to lie to protect my brother. They were never willing to tell the truth to protect us. If we're to utilize the friend's own scapegoat narrative, even though this narrative didn't come from her but from Meghan and the filmmakers, the friend, a highly questionable source by the way, actually uses the palace as a scapegoat for Meghan because she's highlighting the negative stories about the other members of the family in order to tone down or excuse the negative stories about Meghan. Thus, she and Meghan, as we'll see in a moment, are actually doing the same that they're accusing the palace of doing. Harry and Meghan's helpers monopolize words in their attempts to anticipate objections, and they use all the victim tactics they have the same way our two protagonists do. We On see a shift from a medium shot to a close-up, highlighting this low-key attack as the important part of a rather wild claims that go unchallenged. You would just see it play out. Like a story about someone in the family would pop up for a minute, and they go, we gotta make that go away. Megan picks up where her friend left off, taking jabs at the family that she couldn't praise enough in the inspiring engagement interview. Have you, you've met each other's families, I imagine? Yes, his family's been so welcoming and... and you've met quite a few of them, actually. I have, on both sides of his family, his mom's yeah. side as well, which has been really important to me too. But um, yes, the family has been great and over the past year and a half, we've just had really nice time getting to know them and progressively helping me feel a part of, of not just the mm -hmm. institution, but also part of the family, which has been really, um, really special. Have you met the Queen? I have, yes. Come on, Tommy. Yeah, what was that like? a couple of times. Um, it's incredible, I think. Um, and Catherine's been absolutely um, been wonderful. amazing, as is William as well, he's you know, fantastic support. Let's dwell on this for a moment, because the documentary's premise is that everything was great in the beginning, and that the media liked them. You hear that? That is the sound of hearts breaking all around the world. She's becoming a royal rock star. And then... Everything changed. However, in the engagement interview, while she was praising the family and obviously before she married into it, Meghan directly said that she had witnessed mistruths, a euphemism for lies. I've never been part of tabloid culture. I've never been in pop culture to that degree and, and lived relatively quiet life, even though I focused so much on my job. And, um, and I think we were just hit so hard at the beginning with a lot of mistruths that 
I made the choice to not read anything, positive or negative. It just didn't make sense, and instead we focused all of our energies just on nurturing our relationship. On us. Yeah. On us. Therefore, there's something about the documentary's premise that doesn't add up. And therefore, Megan can't say that she went into the marriage naively, as she tried to in the Oprah interview. Notice how she prefaces the utterance with I would say, thus indicating that she knows there are other interpretations of this. Maybe that she herself knows that she's not giving the real interpretation, but the one that's the most convenient. Finally, either something's changed quite dramatically, or we're not told the whole truth. We hear Megan say that she's chosen not to read anything, but yet the documentary is almost exclusively about her reaction to things she's read. This discrepancy is worth noting. Returning to the clip, Megan starts by using the associating you, not I, as she says. You would just see it play out. Associations designed to make it look like a person isn't alone in thinking or feeling something, even though they might be. They go, Megan uses away. direct speech as if she's quoting. However, did they actually say this? Did Megan even hear them talk like this? It's doubtful, not to say unlikely. It sounds like a made-up quote used to advance her goal. This would be consistent with her use of the impersonal pronoun you rather than I, because she doesn't seem to be the focalizer in this short narrative. The person experiencing things in a narrative is called the focalizer, and what they experience is called the focalized. If it's a made-up, twisted, or even inaccurate quote, it should have no place in a documentary. Also, just, just like her out. friend, she gets like to make it sound like there were lots of negative stories minute. about the other members of the family, but that she simply became a scapegoat for them. This is blame shifting to the nth degree, a way of rationalizing without having to take personal accountability for any of her specific behaviors or specific statements. Everything simply boiled down to a scapegoat narrative. When things sound too good to be true, well, but there's real estate on a website homepage. There is real estate there on a newspaper front cover. And something has to be filled in there about someone royal. Now it's about real estate, another excuse for the many headlines. It's true that there are newspapers and tabloids that write about royals every day. And some of what they write, maybe even most of it, is inaccurate to say the least. This is morally wrong. However, I don't think that's the issue here, because it's not exactly new information. In fact, it's common knowledge and, more importantly, common sense. She would have known about this long before the engagement interview. Royal people make headlines everywhere. That's the name of the game, but it's also the name of any game that involves public figures. Actors, directors, musicians, CEOs. Megan isn't describing something new or shocking. She's stating the obvious as a way of finding excuses. Maybe as to why she wasn't celebrated the way she thought she would be. Or maybe because she already had ambitions long before the marriage. In one of her podcasts, she interestingly links the word ambitious to dating Harry. This isn't exactly the only time that Meghan and Harry use self-praise as a way of trying to substantiate their excuses. When someone who's marrying in who should be a supporting, a supporting act is then stealing the limelight or is doing the job better than the person who was born to do this, that upsets people. It shifts the balance. This clip is unintentionally ironic. The two of them spent most of the documentary complaining about media, complaining about being covered in a negative way as compared to William and Catherine. However, when the very same media favor Meghan and Harry, there's no problem. And when the very same media favor them in comparison to William and Catherine, there's no problem. Also, again, this narrative doesn't line up with the mistruths that they said they faced as early as the engagement interview. We notice Harry's distancing language, talking about when someone is marrying in, and the person who was born to do this. This is intentional, of course, but it's also a very easy way out in the documentary. Furthermore, it's a way for Harry to praise himself and Meghan without stating it explicitly. Because that would be too much. Indirectly then, combined with the headlines, Harry is saying that both he and Meghan did a better job than William, Catherine, and even the Queen. This indicates that he's driven by the same competitive mindset as the media he presumably has a problem with. 
after an event where every single member of the family, senior members of the family had been, including the Queen, and on the front page of the Telegraph, Meghan. First of all, that's not how arguments work. Harry is choosing an example which favors his pre-existing beliefs about how badly Meghan was allegedly treated. But as long as he doesn't detail the subject matter of the article and its context, this is cherry-picking. As if simply showing the picture is enough to shock the audience and make them empathize with Meghan. Secondly, he's also in the picture, so it's not just Meghan. Which leads me to the third point. That new members of all celebrity families are given special media attention, unwanted or not. Thus, from a marketing standpoint, a picture like this sells a lot more newspapers. Getting close to a few members' faces resonates a lot more with people than seeing an entire family from a distance, which is impersonal in comparison. Megan shares her shot with us. I went, oh my god. She was like, but it's not my fault. And I said, I know. And my mom felt the same way. She's using went, effective oh prosody, god. whispering her alleged surprise for emotional effect. Also, notice how her voice is up front for oh emotional effect. And she delivers the line almost as if she were an actress. Wait. The pathos continues as Harry invokes the narrative about his mother, as if she and Meghan can be paralleled. Again, phone, this is a rhetorical I'm shortcut, making generalizing comparisons and arguments without having to deal with specifics, just like they've done in the clips we've seen and the two trailers that I've analyzed in previous videos. Also, it's a narrative that he's used so often that I don't think it's the best rhetorical move anymore. That's it. Click the like button and subscribe to the channel. Thanks for tuning in.